Good evening, everybody. Thank you very, very much for coming out. 2023, as I've said a couple of times already, um, is turning out to be really, a really great year for this news group. Um, another really good turnout on the back of February, on the back of uh, uh, January. Um, there's a couple of other announcements that we might make towards the end of the session. I do not want to steal um, time from Greg Breen and Jason Bullahan here, who tonight are going to take you through IoT. Um, you've already seen the, um, uh, the abstract online, I'm sure. Um, that's enough from me. Over to you guys. <laughs> okay. I'm going to try the microphone. We'll see how we go. Okay, all good? Okay, fantastic. Uh, hello, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Greg Breen. I'm an IoT specialist uh, solutions architect with AWS. Uh, looks like we've got a pretty good crowd tonight. Thanks a lot for coming along. I'm not under any illusion though that you're here to see me. I'm just the warm up act and we'll uh, be bringing out the rock star in due course. Aging rock star. Aging rock star. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to take you through uh, an introduction in uh, industrial IoT solutions on AWS, uh, cover off uh, some of the uh, services that you would be, uh, use to build a solution like that and uh, how they might fit together. But uh, before I dive into that, uh, I, I want to get some kind of def definition around what an industrial IoT workload is. Uh, so at a very high level and very simplified model, pretty much every IoT workload uh, falls into one of two categories. Connected product, uh, which is a real device-oriented workload, or an industrial workload on the right. This, this is making terrible noise. I might try without. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. All right. Let's get... We will share the slides afterwards. Sure. Okay. Uh, so yes, uh, connected product uh, workload is probably what most people think of when, uh, if they know anything about IoT and start thinking about uh, IoT, uh, maybe you've experimented at home with your own home automation stuff, your Arduino to control your kettle or whatnot. Uh, a device-oriented workload is that kind, of, uh, that kind of workload, so consumer products. Uh, we have lots of customers in that space. Amongst my customers that I personally deal with, we have all sorts of interesting things like solar powered LoRaWAN uh, dairy cow collars, uh, vehicle telematics, uh, public transport payment systems and, and a lot more. In these kind of workloads, every device makes an individual and independent connection to the cloud. And in the AWS context, that work, uh, connection is normally to AWS IoT Core, which is designed for this kind of workload. So you have many devices, each with their own independent connection and hence many connections. And these connections are all a thin pipe. Uh, there's, a, there's a hard limit on each one of 100 messages per second in the case of MQTT connections to the MQTT broker and up to 512 kilobytes per second. And if you need more capacity than that, then you need to add more devices uh, to, to your uh, solution to get more data in. In the case of Industrial, by contrast, we're ingesting, of course, from industrial equipment, PLCs, SCADA, Historian, and with industrial protocols like OPC UA. And typically, we need something uh, at the edge, an industrial gateway to aggregate the data from those different industrial sources and, uh, uh, in essence, do a, a protocol translation into a protocol that's suitable to publish to the cloud. And so on the left, we have many devices with many independent connections. And on the right, we pretty much end up with a single device and a single connection, a fat data pipe to the cloud. And in the AWS context, AWS IoT SiteWise is the service that would normally ingest uh, from this kind of data source. It's purpose built for industrial ingestion with the help of a gateway at the edge. Okay. Can I have a show of hands? Anyone who's familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs? All right, good, good. Plenty of people have been to company offsites. Good to see. So, 
Uh, on the basis of that, I borrow that idea and I present to you the IoT hierarchy of needs. And I, I hope this model will work. It's the first time I've tried this slide out, so let's see. Uh, six layers uh, to, to this model. So similar to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we're starting with really essential uh, needs at the bottom and working our way up uh, to our, our higher order needs, uh, our self actualization at the top. And this pretty much describes the journey that a lot of customers want to go on. And often in the initial conversation, they're already talking about the self actualization at the top, but they're nowhere near to getting there and we have to work our way up there. So just briefly calling out the six layers, you know, the first problem that needs to be solved is how to connect uh, to these various uh, industrial equipment of all sorts of different types, different manufacturers, lots of protocols and how to ingest that data. Once you land it in the cloud, how to organise it uh, in such a way that you can make sense of it, to contextualise it. And once you've done that, now you've got data in the cloud. Well, presuming, of course, you want to land in the cloud and, and possibly to AWS. Once you've got the data landing in the cloud and it's organised and contextualised, now you can do something useful with it. And usually the first thing customers want to do is visualisation, monitoring and alerts, usually some uh, near real-time dashboards. So it tends to start there. Once you've got those first three layers, you've now gotten to somewhere where you've actually got a system that's delivering business value, right? You're actually getting your data in and doing something useful with it. And often for a lot of businesses, this is already a great initial step because now they have visibility and insight into their assets that they didn't have before. But going beyond that, as we work up the hierarchy of needs, a lot of customers want to have on-premise monitoring. Their, their assets might be at a remote site uh, where there's uh, perhaps uh, low bandwidth connection to the cloud or not a very reliable connection to the cloud. Perhaps operations need to continue even if that connection goes down. So they might uh, want their, their real-time monitoring and, and dashboards available at the edge as well. And with all that data landing in the cloud, supporting the near real-time use cases, over time you build up historical data. Customers want to start using that for analytics and BI to be able to get deeper insights uh, into their operations, see opportunities for improvement and optimization. And then finally, we get back to where the conversation started, which is usually ML insights for even deeper insights, automated actions, things like uh, predictive maintenance use cases. So with those six layers in mind, I present to you a very generalised architecture of an industrial solution and we're going to break it down now according to the six layers that we just talked about. So starting uh, with connection and ingestion. So as far as the AWS IoT services go, Greengrass and Sitewise are, are very much the cornerstone of the connection and, and ingestion solution. So let's dive a little deeper onto those. All right, I'm going to ask for another show of hands. Who's familiar with AWS Lambda? <laughs> Good, should be at this user group. Okay, so if you're familiar with AWS Lambda, you know that uh, when a managed service can't solve a problem for you through configuration, Lambda is pretty much the go-to, right? Solve any problem, Swiss Army knife, get out of uh, trouble service. It's your MacGyver service. But at the edge, Greengrass is your MacGyver. Greengrass is a, an edge runtime that can run on a device and a companion cloud service that, that lets you compose or helps you uh, compose and deploy and manage uh, complex applications at the edge. Uh, you can deploy, well it has a concept of components which are just blobs of software of different type that you can deploy and that's all baked into to Greengrass. It can deploy uh, on systems where there's intermittent connectivity, it's all designed to handle that. But you can deploy components that are lambdas, docker containers, OS processes which tend to be the most common type of component, machine learning inference uh, models, basically anything you can imagine because they're all AWS service teams and supported by AWS service teams and amongst them are some components for SiteWise. Uh, SiteWise components uh, that you can deploy to Greengrass to construct 
an industrial gateway to ingest into green grass without you having to develop any code. It's all basically click ops through uh, the console with SiteWise to uh, deploy a, a green grass based industrial uh, edge gateway to ingest into SiteWise. Okay, so SiteWise ingestion. It actually supports three different ways of ingesting. You can ingest uh, through AWS IoT Core and MQTT. Uh, in my experience, this is certainly not the most common way that it happens with SiteWise, but where I gave the model initially of connected product and industrial, there's lots of shades of grey. Customers often have all sorts of combinations, uh, but you can do it that way. But most commonly, customers are ingesting, as we've been talking about already, via a gateway. And then thirdly, they can ingest with the help of an AWS SDK. And where that most commonly gets used is uh, customers might be ingesting a lot of data from, let's say, fixed plant assets uh, uh, in their operation or at their site. But they might also have some other data streams that are available in the cloud. They might want to consolidate the two together into site-wise, maybe with the help of a Lambda use the AWS SDK and plumb that code uh, into SiteWise as well. Not that code, that data into SiteWise as well. All right, data contextualization. Uh, we're still on SiteWise for this because of it's one of its uh, main purposes in life. So let's talk about that a little bit. SiteWise has the concept of uh, a model uh, hierarchy. You can build a, a model of your assets, virtual representation of your, your assets in a hierarchy, similar to object-oriented programming concepts, classes, and, and objects. So asset models and then instances of those uh, assets from the asset model. Uh, once you have the asset models uh, you, you, or the assets, you're able to attach your data streams to properties Within those assets, you can do transformations uh, and, and alerting and all sorts of things on, on the data when it's part of an asset model. And just to give a little more context on what that looks like in this diagram here, we've got two uh, data streams coming from two presses on one line coming in through the gateway and each data stream goes to a property within one asset within the model. Storing of the asset data. So SiteWise also has a um, time series database. And no, it is not time stream. SiteWise predates time stream. Uh, it's its own um, time series database. So all that data, all the data streams coming in, which can be associated with an asset model, but don't have to be. They can just be the data streams if you prefer. They're all stored in the time series uh, database. In terms of how this database uh, differs from something like TimeStream, SiteWise is very much optimised to support single time, single time series uh, data queries for supporting uh, near real-time operational dashboards. That's really uh, optimised in terms of performance, but also in terms of cost. So if that's the kind of use case that you have, SiteWise will generally be a better selection than TimeStream. Time stream is better for more complex SQL queries uh, where you're picking from multiple time series and uh, perhaps uh, a little more, uh, slightly more BI oriented than the uh, operational dashboards that SiteWise would typically support. Okay, monitoring and alerts and the operational dashboards that we've already mentioned a few times. You have several options that are commonly combined with SiteWise. First of all, SiteWise has its own no-code dashboarding solution uh, built into the service called SiteWise Monitor. You can see uh, the animation working hard here to show some of the features. It's a true no-code uh, dashboarding solution. It's designed to target people who don't have programming skills, don't have SQL skills, but need to be able to create dashboards from the data that's arriving in to SiteWise. As you can see, you can create all sorts of charts and, and thresholds and uh, alarming in there. Uh, it's pretty flexible. It's maybe not quite as flexible as the, the next one we'll talk about, but uh, the advantage is it's truly a, a no-code uh, solution. Grafana, okay, so 
Lots of people, of course, especially perhaps a bit more in the IT space than the OT space are already very familiar with Grafana, very comfortable with the tool and, and have a preference for using it over SiteWise Monitor in some cases. Um, so Grafana is commonly used by our customers. It's low code rather than no code. So that's something to bear in mind in terms of uh, who maybe within your business would use it and build the dashboards. Um, but uh, it's still a powerful solution. There's a plugin for Grafana that uh, is for SiteWise, so it can get easy access to the SiteWise data streams or the properties in the asset model if you, if you build an asset model. Um, and there was one other little point I wanted to make in having a mental block. Um, uh, we'll have to just move on. I'll see if it comes back. TwinMaker. So just to touch on TwinMaker briefly, TwinMaker is a service that helps you build uh, 3D representations of your assets um, and then uh, attach your data streams uh, that are coming from your, your models, uh, from your site-wise models and assets, attach them uh, into the, the 3D assets uh, within the, the scenes. Um, so, uh, TwinMaker, you use it to build uh, your scenes with the data attached, but it actually renders within Grafana. So there's a plugin for TwinMaker for, for rendering the, uh, the 3D view. You can have tags on your assets, which as you can see here with the, the time series as it goes above and below the threshold, uh, we can see the tag changing in the TwinMaker 3D view. And this down at the bottom right here is supposed to be a, a video stream from the facility at the same time. It kind of looks like another 3D thing, but it's meant to be your, your real-time video. Um, but the, the, the real advantage here is you can really achieve a single pane of glass view of your operations where you've got your dashboards alongside your, your 3D view, alongside your video, all within Grafana with uh, a lot of plugins. Okay. Sitewise Edge, so on-premise monitoring. Sitewise uh, Edge is, a, is a, another service part of uh, the Sitewise collection of services. It's uh, essentially components that you can deploy, um, pre-built components supported by AWS that you can deploy to Greengrass uh, to get your on-premise monitoring. Uh, so yeah, with SiteWise Edge, you can uh, collect and process and store and monitor at the edge. So you might, for example, choose not to send all of your data to the cloud. You might only uh, choose to send a subset because there is uh, maybe not enough bandwidth to send or maybe there's just no value in sending it all and you want to reduce your costs and just process some at the edge. And you might use SiteWise Edge to deliver dashboards on site so operations can continue even if your cloud connection goes down. And because it's just more green grass uh, components, it's uh, relatively easy to uh, deploy these uh, to the edge on your existing green grass devices. Data analytics and BI. So as we're about to see, SiteWise has a feature to help you easily get your data into S3 to support a data lake uh, to support your analytics and BI use cases. And that feature is the cold tier. We talked about the time series database, but SiteWise also, uh, which is the hot tier, but time, uh, SiteWise also has the cold tier, which is essentially data being exported out of that hot tier at regular intervals into S3, gradually building up your data in S3 to make it available for your analytics and BI. And you can configure various retention settings. And then once it's in S3, you, of course, can uh, leverage our, our suite of uh, services, uh, Glue, Athena, QuickSight, and the like, uh, to build your analytics and, and BI reports. And I, I think I just heard my first yawn. So uh, this is the last slide. <laughs> You'll be relieved to know. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't assigning blame, I just heard it. Um, so insights and actions with ML. So uh, in reviewing uh, this deck uh, with Jason, he immediately made the very good point that Amazon look out for vision and Amazon look out for equipment, for equipment uh, not currently available in Sydney, but I stress the key word is currently. 
Um, I'm not going to talk in depth about ML because it's a little out of my domain, but obviously once you've got your industrial data lake, you can leverage the ML services, uh, our SageMaker at least in Sydney and hopefully the other two before too long, uh, to, to build your models. But the main thing I really want to call out is with Greengrass, you can deploy your models to the edge. And this is one of the things that the IoT services will give to you. So if you need perhaps quicker response time, uh, in your inferencing or you need it to continue to operate even if you don't have your cloud connection, you want to do the inferencing at the edge, you can deploy your models to green grass to achieve those kind of use cases. But of course you can also do it in the cloud. And that's really about me. You've heard, the, seen the pretty pictures and heard the nice story and I think uh, now I'm going to hand over to Jason and he's going to give us uh, his battle scars and a dose of reality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Just need to give me one or two minutes of uh, swapping over screens. Well, that's happening if anyone's got any questions. Happy to have a go. Oh, Christian. <laughs> Is this a disruptive architecture? Are we going to, is, is there still a place for OSI Pi and the historians in the world, or you know, is that dated? That's a very effective question, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'd, I'd say at the moment, with where uh, Sidewise and this kind of solution is, it's not, uh, not quite a, a replacement of the certainly the service team. That, that's the messaging from them at this time. <laughs> Greg, what have been the reason why it wouldn't be an equivalent of, of Pi? Uh, well, I mean, at the, at the moment, um, it, it is lacking, uh, I think, some of the, I mean, first of all, I would probably preface this by saying I don't really have a lot of direct experience with OSI Pi myself, but uh, I think in terms of uh, SQL queries and sidewise itself, there's only um, the, the whole tier uh, aspect at the moment with Athena, so maybe not quite as, um, as uh, tripped out as it could be at this point, but these are things that are, are being addressed in due course. What sort of um, uh, historians does SiteWise connect into um, directly? So at the moment, SiteWise uh, off-the-shelf supports uh, OPC uh, UA, so if anything has an OPC UA interface, uh, UA interface that's, that's possible. Uh, there's other protocols uh, coming soon, let's say, and it's always possible to develop your own custom components in Greengrass to connect to any other protocol that you want to, and there's various uh, solutions available, commercial and open source, that you can deploy as a component on Greengrass as well. The security model around, I suppose, the, the whole IoT environment. Are you able to elaborate on that, especially on the edge side of the cluster? Uh, well, um, maybe I'm not quite sure what you mean there with the security model, but certainly, you know, in terms of green grass connecting to the cloud, it's, it's all secured uh, in the normal way that our IoT devices are. So, X509 certificates for authentication and IoT policies. So, it connects the IoT core, the, the green grass, uh, for its. Uh, MQTT connection and then uses a credential provider to exchange the X509 certificate for SIGV4 credentials and then it's able to use that for HTTP interface. We also have a range of other services that you can deploy with Greengrass and in particular the main one uh, for your uh, security posture would be Device Defender which you can uh, use just in the cloud for auditing your devices and do cloud-side metrics, but it also supports device-side metrics, and you can even have uh, some custom metrics. So you can be doing things like monitoring your device to see if it's opening ports that it shouldn't be, and get those reported into the cloud. Thank you. 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 Um, about the need for connection and ingestion at the start, right? Um, would you also, uh, where would you place the need for security controls on that uh, hierarchy as well? Uh, you mentioned green grass having most of it. 
Uh, so like, would we have seen them their connection, or would you have seen that after you had seen No, no, def definitely it's part of the, the connection, and, and yeah, I mean, that's potentially a whole other topic there with uh, the security side of things, so probably I've lost over that bit, but certainly security is job zero, and you're at the bottom really of that high right. Good call out, I'm going to adjust that though. <laughs> <laughs> Suffice to say, I believed you, so I hope, I, I hope it's secure, right? <laughs> uh, any more questions for, for Greg? Yeah, why not? Because I think I could have jumped in there as well and uh, you know, give, given, given you a hand, but no, I'll let you burn by yourself. <laughs> yeah, so uh, thanks a lot for everybody to uh, come to us uh, and uh, myself to uh, see this uh, presentation tonight. Uh, my name is Jason Houlihan and I'm, uh, uh, I've been dubbed by Jen as the uh, Industrial IoT Specialist at MinRes and uh, I was fortunate enough to, you know, we, we've worked together very well and, uh, you know, that I was uh, able to uh, present to this forum as well to, you know, show off the good stuff that we've got. Um, a colleague of mine suggested the title of bringing the instrument to the boardroom and it was sort of a little bit reluctant doing that because of the case of where we have a technical audience here and if you see the boardroom, you might go, oh, go whatever, you know, and, and move on with that. But um, the, the key point was that, uh, yeah, we're on a journey ourselves. Um, we've got, uh, uh, well, can we call that the brain's hierarchy of needs? Is that? I'd rather you didn't. Well, so, so, we're, so we're talking about ML and uh, we, uh, you know, have to realise that we've got that, that point there where, you know, we've got the various steps that we need to go through. So our situation here is, uh, you know, just a little bit of a uh, open slideshow to, you know, what we're able to, uh, you know, achieve with the AWS platform. And uh, yeah, we'll have a look. So unfortunately, um, you know, we, we do have the, the fortunate uh, case where we're able to uh, borrow effectively the Minerals data. <clears throat> Oh, excuse me, I'm shaking like a leaf, to be honest. I sort of <laughs> must have had too much Coke. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, right? <laughs> yeah, it's on camera, that's it. Okay, Coca-Cola, please, yeah, and it, no sugar. But, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, this is a hard one to recover from. Um, but yeah, just please respect the fact that uh, you know we're not. Um, I'm not soliciting for uh, investment in the company and, and things like that. And so you know, it's here as an honest intent to be able to demonstrate the data that we have. So uh, without that way, um, also later on, because we do have uh, uh, we do have the live data streaming through. Um, again, you know, we've got a fist of quotes, and you know, one of them never work with animals or children. All live data. Um, a colleague in the room here, once upon a time we, uh, you know, used to demonstrate at uh, live shows and I always thought that, uh, you know, it's not a good demonstration unless there's a failure or, you know, something goes wrong with it. But anyway, hopefully we don't see that tonight. And I'm lucky uh, because I've got, um, I've got a really interesting topic, I enjoyed it. Uh, I've worked it a number of years and um, in the historian space, I think to reference back to yourself, Christian, um, you know, is that uh, I've had a number of years uh, in this environment and I'm really excited about the platform, uh, you know, that uh, and potentially disruptive in my opinion. So these opinions are my own. <laughs> um, so just the uh, context. So uh, I guess uh, I was just wondering, is there anybody who's unfamiliar with mining uh, in the room? Okay, yeah, so um, with, with uh, mining, I'm glad you two, you three didn't uh, put your hands up. So, with, uh, with mining, uh, you know, it is essentially an uh, intensive physical uh, asset and a lot of money goes into buying the large uh, pieces of equipment. And so on that basis, so I'm not sort of going to go into 101 so much, but just to understand that, you know, there's a lot of investment, uh, big equipment, and uh, in order to uh, maximise return on investment and also operate safely, um, we are after data in uh, various ways. And so, again, the, the business activity of safe and efficient operations are obvious drivers for us to you know, go down the path of being able to retain as much data as we can 
the simple analogy is uh, you, you have a car, you know what the uh, fuel reading is, you know what the tyre pressures are, you know uh, uh, the, uh, the, what, what the fuel gauge is in your speedometer. So the same concept is that you've got the same uh, analogy with, uh, with the equipment and you'd expect to say that uh, with, with a large yellow truck, for example, you'd want to know what that fuel is and we can also then extract that data and then make sort of assessments in, uh, in performance issues and being able to uh, enhance the uptime of the vehicle. Um, we also, we selected uh, the IoT approach. Um, we were initially AWS customers and uh, so then Greg, uh, you know, said, hey, what about SiteWise? And, uh, you know, here we are. So, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's been a, been a uh, very interesting uh, experience throughout the whole lot. Uh, kicked off, I think, about two years ago when um, Greg hosted a workshop online for IoT. And I endured three days of you. Uh, put <laughs> and Jude's not the right word, is it? Yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, it was very informative. And at that time, we were on Greengrass One as well. And um, so, fortunately, it's moved on to Greengrass Two. And I can say that it's a lot uh, more simple uh, in my experience that uh, for for what we have now. So. Um, we also then, uh, so we, we, we have uh, AWS SiteWise as the, as the core uh, for the time stream, uh, time series data um, as the centerpiece. And then we have the green grass for, uh, for ingestions. Um, and I think you referred to that as the gateway, but I, I call it green grass, I'm simple. Um, and we also cho chose uh, AWS managed uh, Grafana as well. Um, that was an interesting sort of experience. We sort of had to weigh up uh, pros and cons of that because you can also get AWS, or you can get Grafana by itself, grafana.com. You can get Grafana hosted on your own service, but we ended up selecting AWS managed Grafana. Being an enterprise, we're um, interested in uh, supportability, sustainability and the likes uh, so that we've got uh, some, uh, one of our users are able to just uh, ask the IT desk to be added to the AD group and it just magically all happens together as well. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of uh, you know, interesting things that we uh, went through. Um, so the, the crux of it, uh, that, so the boardroom, the C-suite, chief suite, um, they've now got the capability to view real-time data through the Grafana dashboards and uh, fortunately the, the one of the most important things, I think, is that uh, the a AWS managed Grafana renders nicely on your phone straight away without any uh, mucking around. And uh, that uh, gives the, um, the, the concept. So we have a chief operating officer who's sitting on it continuously. Um, when the, when the, uh, the, the plant itself uh, that he was monitoring uh, had an outage at the time, uh, he phoned up the, uh, phoned up the site straight away and so now the site don't like me because I've given them that visibility. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but uh, one of the things is that, you know, it is empowering. So the, that particular site, they, uh, the, uh, it w wasn't done uh, without their consultation. It was, uh, you know, they said that um, I'm sick to death of that COO to phone me up all the time and say, you know, what's the numbers going on and uh, this other person doing this and that. And uh, so then they ended up, they were sort of quite happy that they were able to outsource their reporting requirements to whoever wants it reported on. So the end user is able to uh, embrace that. Um, the, the other uh, interesting part too with the uh, with this, uh, I've got that edge data is available for further enrichment um, for disparate data sources for decision support. Might have been on Coke then, Coca-Cola. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the, the thing with, uh, with that edge data, so we call the edge data in our situation that uh, we, we've got our uh, control systems and, um, uh, and so our control system data is able to be uh, placed into the site wise and so then we're able to uh, put that in concept with other data sources that we have uh, around the place. So uh, for example if we have uh, oil analysis uh, from a truck going into the platform 
that's now available to the ERP for work order ingestion and the likes. And uh, at the time, that was a case of where we had pieces of paper flying around the place, and now we can do it in a semi-autonomous uh, fashion, which is pretty cool. Um, and I think I've got my order mixed around. Yeah, so that dashboarding part. Um, so we, just to go back on the, on the end user experience was that uh, the way we uh, introduce Grafana into the end users is that uh, we give them a little bit of a session to say, we'll show you how to fish and then you go catch your own fish. And it's enough to be able to get um, uh, enough runs on the board so that they're up and productive. It takes about two hours. Uh, Generally, if somebody's uh, you know, slightly IT savvy and whatnot, they, they can pick up the platform uh, quite readily and be, and be productive. And uh, I actually learned one or two things off my end users to, uh, that you know, I've actually lifted and stolen and reused, repurposed myself. So it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a really good experience that um, I, as an as a IT person, I'm a plumber in, in that case, and they're able to then uh, surface their own data and make meaning of the you know, particular data set that is of importance to them. Um, so I guess for me, I think uh, I've, uh, it's, it's been described to me with uh, AWS as uh, being a whole bunch of Legos thrown on the ground and you go build your own thing. I sort of think it's like a you know, deconstructed Vegemite sandwich and um, you know, we need to put this back together so that we can make sense of you know, what, what we're after. And so for, for us, uh, the, the point there with the, you know, some use cases need a fast product. Um, we've got the situation where yeah, our end user, they're sort of not so much concerned about the AWS um, bits and bobs and the, it's very important to me. Okay. <laughs> but um, they, they just want to see their Grafana and, and uh, you know, move on with life and uh, get productive. And you know, that's the, the whole purpose of being able to expose the data, liberate the data you know, for them to be able to get that. Um, and I found uh, like, yeah, with well, the, the two years ago when I was uh, sort of going down the journey as well, it was really quite overwhelming um, to see all the different components of uh, what was needed to make a final solution. And then, you know, one night I just went, Duh, okay, get this. And now I feel like I'm a bit of a whiz at it, you know, it's, it's okay, I can get there. <laughs> so, um, so needless to say, um, so this is a bit of a mud map, um, how we put that together. I think to uh, some of the, 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 uh, the, the interest there might be that we, our, our particular situation is that we have uh, 15 odd uh, manufacturing sites uh, around the state and uh, we have uh, this requirement. So we've basically got this situation where we have, we have to convert everything from the protocol OPC DA. Anybody familiar with OPC DA? Yep, okay, cool, your job. <laughs> I'll step back. Um, so OPC DA is a, um, a control system protocol for uh, the manufacturing plant. And uh, it's a legacy, it's sort of built on specifically to Microsoft stack. And um, the, uh, we, we sort of have to live with OPC DA where um, we have some old sites where it's just not practical to upgrade it to an OPC UA type uh, protocol environment. Um, and so then we've gone and employed this uh, other, this uh, third party product called uh, Kepware. Um, Kepware is effectively just a protocol converter. It converts data from a DA type to a UA type. And then it's available for consumption in the, in the cloud services. So, the, um, so we, we've got uh, a couple of, a bit of a hybrid environment. We have some edge devices that are sitting out there that are already producing a, a UA, um, UA type data face. And uh, that makes it nice and easy for us to go straight into uh, green grass. Um, then the, the other one. So what I've got here specifically site kepware is that we have um, uh, just in case the network does go down, this site kepware is able to buffer it, store and forward uh, the data when the connectivity comes back online again. And then it, 
I've federated everything into uh, this central Kipware service. So then you know, there's one big blob sitting in the middle there and it's just busy listening to about 11,000 tags per second, or 11,000 data points uh, per second coming from the different sites. Pretty good. And then uh, absolutely hammers the, the green grass component. So this is where now we, you know, the, the, uh, the, the cloud meets on premises at that point in time and the, uh, the green grass then um, transfers that to the IoT core. Um, IoT core goes into SiteWise. So I think of SiteWise as being the central hub um, for the time, uh, time series data, so timestamp and a value uh, sitting against that data. And we've got Athena wrappers around there and um, lambdas on the other side there. I liked your slide earlier, actually. I wish I'd pinch that because one was the IPC UA animation and the other one was the um, SDK. And so we, we've got uh, a lot of the AWS SiteWise SDK um, component going on here as well. Oh, there we are, that point there. Um, and uh, we've got numerous uh, external calls uh, going out to um, uh, API REST APIs uh, out in the cloud to bring that time series data. So it's really nice that we're able to have all of this time series data sitting in one, uh, one location. Um, so we, we, we chose, uh, that should be Amazon Managed Grafana, but we chose uh, Amazon Managed Grafana for the presentation for the end users. Sort of gone on about that already. Um, and uh, Power BI is our corporate choice, and so we've wrapped that up with an Athena uh, front, front end over the, uh, over the cold storage. So sort of, at, again, some time ago, all of this was quite overwhelming about all the nuts and bolts, but you know, I guess on this side of the fence, we finally got there and you know, it's a, it, it works, works really well. Right, this is zoom in time, right? <laughs> better, better put my best face on for this. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess uh, um, at the, uh, you know, we're, uh, I'm sort of quite proud and, uh, you know, able to demonstrate live data and, um, and also the, some of the work that the uh, end users have, you know, built themselves. Um, I've also got a particular environment there where it's a sandbox and, you know, it's all sorts of weird things go on there as well, but uh, we'll see how we go. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that, sorry. Yeah, that, that's just a, a request by uh, uh, by my leadership. You know that uh, you know, it's uh, we. It could be misconstrued. You know, if it's uh, recorded and out of context uh, for, for what we're looking at. Um, so yeah, I thought I'd jump through the stack, and hopefully I don't blow the time out. So we've got the situation here where we have um, our uh, uh, Active Directory synchronized with, um, with uh, uh, SSO IAM. And so here we are. So one of the nice parts about this, so I can see that one of the users is sitting up there at the moment and uh, you know, is uh, monitoring this particular process. So Mount Marion is our, um, is, is our uh, lithium site in the gold fields. Um, one of the things here, I was sort of uh, speaking to some colleagues earlier and I said, oh, you know, go figure that we obviously had some sort of outage at this point in time as well for whatever reason. Um, the, this uh, represents the production feed uh, of you know, what the crushing process, the, the input into the process. And um, then this, we have this little feature here with a, with a green heart uh, sitting on there. And that's where the, uh, the end user has gone and um, created an a, um, um, a asset or an alarming uh, feature on there as well. And uh, so you know, green heart means it's, everything's healthy. The other feature that um, the end user uh, uh, 
showed me as well was that the Amazon managed Grafana gives this, uh, that there's a discrepancies to, to uh, can't quite read that, uh, discrepancies to review. Um, that's to summarise in a rolling, it's a, it's a live summary of uh, data that's, uh, that he's set up the um, alert learning conditions and that he's able to make um, uh, active decisions on you know, whatever conditions have uh, gone on. Um, so all of that data is just coming through from the control system, through that architecture that I described earlier and presenting itself in, in uh, Grafana. And best part about it, I didn't have to do this. I showed the, the end user um, what, what, what to do about it and uh, they went and constructed a whole bunch of things that are meaningful to them. Um, and this, this one's actually sort of quite, quite, uh, quite a dense. Um, just to, if, you, if you also reflect on that, we, we've got, uh, the, this is the last six hours worth of data and this data is coming through second by second as well. And uh, so we've got 86,400 seconds in a day and uh, we're looking at already at that screen there, we've got about five, six times 86,400 and it's coming through my phone and uh, the, the thing I just wanted to point out there is that uh, even in this situation here, uh, the, the performance of SiteWise is really quite, um, quite amazing. And it's uh, just... <laughs> yeah, it goes okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, all sorts of visualisations are available uh, using the, the Grafana uh, package, which is uh, yeah, quite nice. Um, I'll just try to get back up to the top. Right. Gosh, yep. Yeah. Okay, so we'll have a look at that. That's the daily trends. Then we have a, uh, another uh, situation. This is a, another site that we have uh, in the, in the uh, Yilgarn region. And so this situation here is that uh, we, we have these edge devices that are uh, coming in and uh, giving us machine uh, health uh, directly live to us. Um, looks like you know, some attention needs to be uh, uh, fed onto that. And uh, uh, one, one particular feature with, uh, with, with th this approach was that we have these edge devices. So you can see on the right hand side that there's a number of um, different names there. So uh, Cooley. One mana, a number of our different sites that are located uh, throughout the state, and uh, we're able to bring that all in and have that on one central um, central location. And so the the end user of this is loving not having to log in each and every single one of those edge devices to be able to um, you know access this type of data. Now it's all on a single pane of glass. Um, So this uh, sort of feature is really exciting for, a, um, for the likes of a reliability engineer because they've got different sensors that are located specifically on individual components of, the, uh, of that equipment. Um, the, uh, I, again, you know, I couldn't walk you through what the, what the individual components mean because the reliability engineer actually constructed this and it's what's important to them. And uh, so that's a good thing. We surface the data, we, we perform the plumbing, and uh, they're able to make the context out of the data for themselves. Uh, there's one very important one here. And uh, Nirmal, you know I'm going to call you out. Yeah, so a colleague of mine has also joined us as well. And um, uh, he, uh, Nirmal uh, also uh, set up the uh, dust monitoring um, project within what we call the IoT platform. And um, that hosted a, a situation where we used, a, we, we had a trailer, a skid, 
um, a data logger on there, a Teltonica modem, went off into the cloud and uh, we used uh, an API. Um, how do I drive this? Is that <laughs> <laughs> Right, so here we are. We've got uh, you know live data beaming in from um, from uh, from the Pilbara there, and um, you can see that it's still 32 degrees up there as well right now. And uh, we put the longitude and latitude on this uh, trailer as well, just in case uh, anybody knocked it off, and um, we, we can we've got alerting you know sitting on there as well. So hey, that's no good. Um, and so this sort of use case here is that uh, you know we had a requirement to you know monitor the conditions out there, um, and uh, you know here it is again. So we're talking about industrial IoT where we had that pattern of OPC UA ingestion, and uh, then going through green grass. Now we've got this uh, pattern of ingestion into Sitewise, uh, where we've got the um, AWS um, Sitewise SDK uh, pushing this time series data uh, directly in there. Um, another one, uh, let's see how we go here. So road trains, um, we operate a large fleet of uh, road trains uh, as opposed to rail, so we sort of get uh, difficult to um, access uh, material and, and make extensive use of road trains that uh, are in our fleet. And um, the, the technology there is that we have uh, uh, we call it just broadly telematics, uh, sitting on board each and every single road train. Um, when the data come, when the road train comes within Kui of a um, of a tower, it's able to then transmit its package, and we can get fairly near real time data um, from the road trains that we have running around the place. Um, some of the data set that, that we have is really interesting, and so going back to um, Breen's hierarchy of needs. Um, we talk about ML. This sort of gives us a little bit of um, uh, hope, I guess, for being able to get to that ML place. We're not there yet. Um, where we have this uh, sensor sitting on the motor where um, it's a G-force. So um, if, we, if we know the GPS location, which we do, um, and we, we can see that there's a high uh, G-force event and it's occurring over um, other vehicles, you know, we can then send out a road crew and repair that road, um, make inference out of that sort of data and set up, you know, potentially alerts. Then there's, I guess, the other obvious sort of things of the, um, the you know, the likes of the fuel economy and the machine efficiency, machine health uh, type use case as well. And um, we, we have a pretty rich data set coming through to us. Um, just one little thing, I think we're, we're waiting for the uh, for the GIS mapping uh, component on here, aren't we? Unit's called yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a, it'd be great when when we get there. So that, that's sort of one one actually little thing. Just so it's just a you know an honest thing where um, the we're using the uh, AWS managed uh, Grafana instances that we don't have the full um, gamut of all the plugins available to uh, Grafana, um, and you know very good reason for that. Uh, they Security is uh, number one. Um, then the other part too is if uh, you've had any experience with Grafana is that the, um, uh, the, when they do an upgrade, the maintainer of that package loses interest and you know, so it just ends up being a difficult situation to be in. So we sort of just you know, reconcile the fact of, um, of uh, you know, having a, a secure environment, having a, a well-managed environment. Um, and then just keep on poking, prodding Greg, Greg to uh, say, oh, you know, we'd like to have this. I but just yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess uh, that's. Uh, I think I've made the point about the the uh, extensibility, or you know, the Grafana side of things. Uh, I thought I'd dare have a look to see what you know, site-wise looks like underneath. Whoop. So 
So I guess you just saw a little sneak preview as the sort of costing. Um, so that uh, in terms of uh, industrial uh, components is that we, you know, we find it's sort of quite acceptable for the fact that we're ingesting 25,000 tags, 10,000 tags a second. Um, and the storage is wrapped up there. You know, we're sort of averaging around about the $700 um, um, per month value. And that, that's for both, that's for the Grafanas, for the S3s and for the um, site-wise ingestions and the green grasses and the likes as well. Um, so I guess it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty compelling uh, package to start with. Um, touching on all those data streams that are coming through. So I could keep on scrolling, 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 scrolling. And uh, that's how they present themselves within the uh, site-wise uh, package. Um, we touched on the models and assets. Uh, you've got two options that are available up here. And uh, it's got this associated data streams and disassociated data streams. So what, what we went with um, at the outset was uh, this associated, disassociated. We sort of uh, went down the, uh, maybe the fastest path to get the data available within Grafana. And we went for disassociated data streams. What that means is that we uh, didn't go down the path of creating an asset model and um, equipment hierarchy and the likes. We just got the tags and streams and that we're able to uh, embed that within the Grafana pages. Um, there are pluses and minuses to that approach. Um, the big plus to my perspective is that um, I didn't want to go through a full uh, organisation data mapping master data management program uh, to be able to uh, put this together. And then you have the argument as to whether is this a production problem or is this a mechanical or maintenance problem. So I just thought, no, nah, we'll save that argument for later and we'll just get the data ingested so that we can do something useful with the data immediately and then actually let the end user build their model in their Grafana to be able to expose that data itself. Fortunately, um, you know, when we do go down that path, uh, we are able to then you know, backfill that, that problem and uh, we can have that serious debate internally as to you know, what we want to uh, you know, see as being a master data source and the correct master data source. And we do have the ability to backfill that and reassociate these tags um, back to those uh, assets. Um, hopefully I'm retired by that time. It's a, that's a big, big job, big job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess uh, that's probably the, the end of it uh, in terms of the, the demonstration or the practicality of it. Um, the green grass part, uh, look, it's, it's a little Linux box that just keeps on going. Uh, boasted it had uh, 190 up days uh, uptime, 190 days uptime. And uh, then my uh, infrastructure team, they said, oh, looks like we should probably reduce the resources on it because it doesn't need as much. Uh, that would, uh, what? But uh, yeah, so that, that's uh, effectively what our gateway is as well uh, for the on-premises uh, component. Um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll land that there and uh, then, uh, yeah, take, take, the, take the questions. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for the applause. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I had a question just on that architecture slide that you had before. Um, I noticed you've got like the aggregator and then like a single OPC UA connection through to green grass. Um, what made you decide to go with the aggregator? Was it just the bus capacity, or was it like is that is that not supported by green grass directly, or like as opposed to directly connecting the um, OPC UA devices through? Yeah. To I. Um, uh, we could have done that, and uh, so we ended up. We've we've got about 17 OPC UI generating sources, and I think if to put it back, that, that's your question: is that why why didn't I put the OPC UI data sources directly into Greengrass, yeah. as opposed to federating it? Yeah, uh, yeah. I wanted one console to um, to to operate with, and uh, as opposed to managing. 17 UA components within SiteWise, and then three UA components within the federated source. I just wanted it to be in one spot, uh, uh, as simply as that. But yeah, it can it can do that for sure. Yeah. Just on the green grass parts, I mean, you can strike the gateway. Typically, there's uh, three components that I talked about earlier that are there. There's a collector on the OPC UA 
Wayside it's published at the Sidewise and the Sidewise site in between the stream manager, which is your buffering, so if the cloud's not there, it can buffer a lot of data until the cloud's back and then publish it. Right, so Sidewise does provide a picture. A lot of yeah, yeah, green graphs with those yeah. components. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, just with um, users, you were saying that uh, users can get in and get access to the, the data script. So how do you help them navigate, find that data, and also like the relationships of the data? And, yeah, good question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and swimming in it. Um, yeah, that's Is it overwhelming? It is overwhelming, absolutely. And the, um, uh, the, that is the argument for building that equipment site wise um, asset model. Uh, what, what happens uh, when, when you do go through that process to build out that model? then the end user experience is a little bit more pleasant because they're able to click through a drop down type menu and hierarchy within the environment. Um, however, the downside to that is when you build these things out uh, and you're, you're kind of developing, I guess, um, and you want to build out five uh, particular reports, uh, as a you know, low code developer, you don't want to click through every single tag 20 times and then go to the next one and repeat and repeat. So we've found that the using the data stream approach is that we're able to just copy paste that directly into it. And look, as rustic as it sounds, uh, just give them a big Excel spreadsheet with all the stuff that's relevant to them and then you know they can go copy paste those data elements into there and, and make use of it. At the end of it, we're not sort of opening up the door to so every person can um, generate their own um, dashboard or otherwise we'll be swimming in dashboards and, and, and making no sense of it. You know, what are you using that data for at the end of the day? Um, so, so we've just sort of got the, uh, you know, people in a, um, in a, in a management role managing, managing that particular process, that they're the ones that, okay, I'm accountable for that data and, uh, and responsible for its, you know, accurate uh, transmission and, and use. So then they're the ones who are given the keys and the, the recipe book for, for those data streams. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? So the green grass, you've got a storage forward capability at the edge. Um, but I think you mentioned that SiteWise has like a limited ingest bandwidth. So if you become disconnected, is there like a delay to when SiteWise kind of catches up with the data from the edge? Yeah, yeah. I've had a couple of experiences with that. Um, to go a little bit further back into the architecture, so I actually have, so we have the control system, the data source itself, then I have that, uh, like that Kepware service that was sitting in there when we're talking about the fixed plant piece. Um, there, there's a little bit of store and forward there because that's sitting in situ. And then we have a little bit of store and forward um, in the uh, central uh, situation. Um, and then, uh, then Greengrass itself also buffers uh, as well for when that connection is lost. Um, I've got that sitting at around about seven days worth of uh, uh, backup uh, for that. And um, yeah, when that, when that pipe gets snipped, um, the data ingestion, the network lights up and everything else, but it does take, given the amount of, uh, so 10,000 tags a second times 86,400, you know, uh, seconds, um, you know, that does mean that we do actually have, it's not, when, when that restoration of the network occurs, it, it's not instantaneous, but it's pretty good though. It still, uh, it does take, you know, so for that, that, that magnitude, um, I had a Christmas as it would be, you know, just happened to flake out at that time and um, uh, I had a, um, what was effectively a you know, three or four hour outage uh, over that period and it, it took uh, around about an hour and a half for it to fully recover back you know, from that three and a half hours and that's the full, um, uh, you know, 10,000 odd tags or so. so yeah. So uh, quite capable, and uh, you can configure that buffering as well. The uh, you know for however many days that that you want. Yeah. Just had a question on that, and might be for Greg maybe. Yep. Can you um, can you configure whether it's going to be like last in first hour or first in last hour? Because I mean, maybe yeah. it might be a couple of days, and it'll be like, hey, I want to see. The most recent stuff, yeah, yeah, and you can, and I, I've, I've set it up that way so as to, you know, appease what, what's available immediately and then, you know, backfill, um, you know, as, as time goes through. So there's quite a few advanced features. Uh,
um, or you know, in-depth features, I should say. So you've got uh, uh, Deadpool queries, you've got uh, last in, first out, FIFO, LIFO. Um, you can filter um, uh, node, uh, you can filter data streams as well out from that, so just uh, select a certain thing. Um, but they're all sort of, you, you, when, when you first go on your path down this road, uh, you, you open that up and, and all of that stuff that's really important is actually just hidden under a, a uh, rolled up section and you, when you click on that you go, wow, that's actually all the stuff that I really need, you know, but not this cookie world. But, yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Link to your guide how the senior management insights are in terms of how they are using the insights they have. Yeah, so uh, the, the, the situation there is effectively just that, that um, real time uh, monitoring that they're able to look at. Um, and uh, the, the use case there being the, um, so we're, you know, the lithium, lithium price is red hot at the moment. And so we're, uh, you know, so it gives them the ability to be able to, you know, monitor on, on, on uh, uh, online um, uh, processes. So that, that's the key part. Um, however, uh, going back to the, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, steps through, um, through that hierarchy, is that, you know, we really are just on that uh, monitoring and, uh, you know, in, in that middle layer there at the moment. Because the expectation then is that you know we're able to you know get that further, get enrich our data with machine learning, but they are hopes and aspirations as well. Okay. Yes. What's the um, I guess the employee attitude to it in terms of enthusiasm or reluctance? Yeah, um, I would say that uh, the the enthusiasm has been quite strong for it actually. Um, with one of the screens there, uh, we, we have our live control system sitting on one screen and then we also have the, the, you know, his, the, the, the Grafana pages give a slightly historical perspective. So you've just come in off uh, on today's shift and so you can just at a glance go, okay, that's what happened overnight and, and look straight to it. So it's quite a positive experience for them. So there's two users, one, one's the viewer user and one is the, the person who's um, creating the page. And um, so I think, yeah, the, the pages that you've seen there, they've been end user um, who have designed those pages. And I'd say that, uh, you know, the uptake for that's quite positive. And uh, then the people who are actual recipients of that data or, you know, who are consuming those pages as well, um, you know, they find it generally pleasant experience. It's quite intuitive to use. Um, some, the, you can configure it to uh, dark mode or light mode. And um, you know, it's when, you, when you see it in light mode, it burns my eyes. But you know, we, you need to see dark mode. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's it's a nice tool to work with. Yeah, nice. It's good. Yeah. yeah. Because sometimes you get pushback from people on the practical floor thinking they're being big brother, I guess, isn't it? Yeah. And you have to manage that as a cultural thing sometimes. I think. That's a cultural issue. Yeah. 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 Oh. 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 Good. Gentlemen up the back. <laughs> I was just going to say, in relation to those questions, do you find that you're getting maintenance people coming back to you and saying, oh, can we get this implemented as well? Or do you find that there's a lot more demand for actually, because you're able to show these results, that there's more demand to actually get instrumentation on a lot more things now than there used to be? Yeah, I, uh, that's, that's a good, good observation, good question. Um, that. At the start, when we said uh, IoT and uh, and the likes, um, it, it will be fair to say there was a bit of uncertainty, um, you know, from the uh, end users as to you know what, what what's this really all about? What does it mean to me? And that's a fair call. Um, now that we've uh, been able to demonstrate the capability of the platform, um, we've had the situation where uh, exactly what you've just said. Now I'm drinking from a fire hose, so, yeah. <laughs> and I've got another 14 sites to go, you know. So, <laughs> so there, thank you. Thank you. Yes. There's any number of vendors that would like to offer you a solution to do some of the things that you, you've built here. Just yep. wondering what the, the, the key decision criteria were that caused you to decide to build the solution. Yeah, sure. Um, I think, the, uh, you know, there's financial considerations straight off the bat. 
Um, there's a, it depends on the culture of uh, just buy stuff and then plus um, uh, you, you must be making lots of money so we'll add on a, you know, a little bit more weight onto the table as well. Um, could be one perspective. Uh, but I, I guess I've been fortunate where we've sort of, uh, uh, you know, culturally a little bit, um, uh, we, 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 we sort of do things and, uh, you know, it, it, we've taken on a DIY approach effectively. And, um, and I guess I've, uh, you know, had the support to be able to go down that DIY path as well because, you know, the, the, the platform's performant and capable and, um, and uh, I think, yeah, if we sort of reflect on that, little show of the, the pricing model there as well is that um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's also quite economical for the benefit that you get from that uh, piece. But uh, me personally, uh, I, I, I do like working with the platform and, um, and also it's, it's a step away from, you know, what I have been doing in the past with the traditional uh, solutions. And, uh, you know, I thought, uh, well, I better modernise myself, you know, and, and get, get with it. But also to, uh, you know, I shared with Greg that I just enjoy playing with my toys in the cot. And, and if someone's happy to fund that, you know, I'm <laughs> good with that as well. So, <laughs> yes. Maybe on that subject, um, what, what was the impetus behind starting? Was, was something on fire or was it an opportunity? Or what was yeah. The, why, why did you start? Yeah. Did you start? Yeah, good question. Um, nothing was on fire. It was certainly not. <laughs> and, and no, it really is a case of where we've acquired old mine sites and, and repurposing. Um, we've got old control systems, highly siloed. Uh, is it, in a nutshell, we saw this opportunity that we're able to uh, liberate and you know and, and uh, you know open up the uh, the data flows you know from those respective silos and uh, bring it into one. I think the key part with one of those demonstrations there was that yeah, we had the 18 odd different um, ed edge devices that somebody had to log into, write down the, the number and all the rest of it. Now we just chuck it on one single pane of glass and, and that's it. So that's the, ma the main point, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so a lot of what we've seen for all is all like the monitoring and doing sort of one-way data. Yeah. Do you have plans and is there capability to send controls or commands back to, you know, so it's like, hey, you know, like I see something's wrong here and I'll, you know, shut that down or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Space Odyssey 2001. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Look, I think that that will be, I think it's obviously technically capable, possible, the technology is there, but I think there's humans in the middle there that are, um, They'd have to get a hell of a lot more confidence, you know, in that, in, in having that uh, feedback loop uh, back into the system as well. But yeah, I, that's I'd like to be there, but you know, I guess uh, uh, that's some some way off yet. We, sure. yeah, yeah. Is there any integration with your existing SCADA systems or anything like that? Or like on premise, or is it two separate systems that are siloed, or how does that operate? Or do you still run SCADA? We still have SCADA, yeah. I think there's sort of a bit of an extension to, to the comment where, yeah, no, we, we, we still will be running a traditional stack, uh, process control engineers like their SCADAs and, and the likes. Um, but we're, so we're just providing that window uh, into, that, into that control system. Yeah. Yes? Uh, in terms of implementation and rollout, um, like, how did you guys go about engaging? Like, did you have to engage many technical people? Did you have to hire technical people? Yeah, sure. Um, look, we have uh, we we had a you know typical project team as well, you know PMBA and 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 the likes as well. Um, we did engage uh, uh, external sources at some point in time, and then us then we sort of realised, oh, okay, this is pretty straightforward. We can do it ourselves. Uh, simple as that. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so, in that case, uh, so like to, to get the initial uh, rollout, um, we've got uh, PM, uh, BA, and uh, and me floating around the place as well. It was a really agile team, you know, very very agile team. Then we worked out we can do it ourselves. We can just make one comment on that. You know, in that architecture that uh, Jason showed, not really much code. Right? It's most of the figuring, 
managed services, but it's, it's a little bit there for the, the lambda to ingest from the um, MT data stream, but there's not really a, a lot of actual software development involved in building that solution. Yeah. Yes? Um, I, I thought your comment initially was interesting where you see it, so uh, oh, guy basically picked up the phone and phoned the phone guy, hey, what's going on? <laughs> like, in some ways it's about what people do about the data. Um, and how does that, how does the platform enable those communications rather than the emails or phone to build up and still those things in the box? Like a lot of the comments that were empty, is that a, a user thing or platform thing, do you see an opportunity there? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I do, actually. I, I think, so with the, with the you, you saw that comments box and uh, without, uh, without uh, any, any context within there. Um, that capability, one, one of the features that Grafana does offer is that you can sort of select a particular, um, so when we saw that, uh, that situation there, uh, that the, the operator could have gone in there and actually clicked on to say that um, you know, we're, we've got a planned um, planned outage or, or something like that and type that in and then that would express itself in that commentary box. Um, so yeah, you're right, uh, that did actually occur you know, in previous situations as well and that was more of, uh, uh, we probably just saw something there that, uh, you know, that's the way it is, we can't, we're, we're not perfect. <laughs> But yeah, uh, but it does allow that two-way conversation, you know, via that text message as well. Uh, the uh, AWS also has uh, SNS uh, hookup uh, to that particular feature as well, so you you can you know really ping those uh, SMS texts and emails out to everybody if you set the thresholds nice and low uh, for for your alarming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, I'm job. sure we could be here all night. But um, we do have to wrap it up. Okay, so, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Jason. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you for your questions. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Uh, there was a few more people than anticipated, so unfortunately we don't have any roadies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll deal with next time, please. Next one. Next session is April. April's hard. We've got school holidays, we've got Easter, we've got Anzac Day, there's a bunch of things going on. Last year, we handled this by saying, let's not thrash ourselves with content and let's just make sure that we can catch up for a beer. So uh, we're planning on having a, a, a networking event, a chance we'll see each other and just a, a chance to have a chat. Um, we're looking into some venues uh, at the moment, uh, can't confirm uh, yet. If you've got any ideas, again, let us know. Um, but yeah, uh, a networking event for April um, is something, and it will be the usual third Tuesday of the month, unless there's a particular venue that, you know, it's going to force us to move, but that's what we're planning on at the moment. Any questions? No? Thank you again. Thanks, Jane. Sydney Summit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. Sydney Summit on the... It's, uh, it's anyone got Art registrations closed.